Have your Bibles, we're going to be looking in the book of Philippians. This book is a love story uh, sent down from the Lord that Paul is writing. Uh, this is one of Paul's favorite churches. Uh, he established it on his second missionary journey. I had very few uh, converts through that time, you know, there's a little bit of woman and, and a jailer, a Philippian jailer made up his congregation at first, this little thing. Lily of the Cellar of Purple uh, was the first convert that he did. She became uh, a great uh, supporter of uh, the work of the kingdom, and God used her in a mighty way. And, uh, the jailer uh, and his whole family uh, joined in with that. About 60 to 64 A.D., some words in that area of time that Paul wrote. And he's writing this letter from a Roman jail, of all places, that he would be writing uh, this uh, letter. It's kind of a love letter that he's writing. If you read it, you can see most of the, uh, Paul's writing uh, was always to, to combat something that was going wrong in the church. Uh, this is kind of giving a little bit, he just kind of gives some information and, and things around and tell about himself and how much he appreciated them and what happened. God is using him to do that. And the question would come up, well, what is our great commitment? What, uh, how, what should we do now as Christians? That's what this kind of doing now. And the great commitment that they have. If you have your Bibles, we'll look at it and uh, what the Bible says. I got one verse today. If y'all listen fast, we'll get done fast, okay? I'm not making any promises, though. <laughs> because just as sure as I say, I feel like sometimes I'm not going to be preaching long. I end up preaching long now. Uh, so here's listening. Would you stand with me as we read the Word of God in, in Philippians 1 20? It says, According to my earnest expectation, and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall, shall be manifested in, or magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. That great commitment of Paul. Father, we just pause and thank you for this day. We ask that we might be aware of your presence as we're gathered together in this building. We thank you already for the time we've had to worship you in song and in prayer and in Bible reading. Uh, we ask that we might be uh, continue to be aware of your presence. I pray for someone in this building today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This will be the day that they'll come receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. As you draw them to come, that they might step out on faith and trust in, in what Jesus has already done. And we just thank you in the name of Jesus. We pray, amen and amen. This is a great thing that Paul is writing uh, to this church. You have to understand where Paul's coming from. If you uh, knew nothing else, you'd have to say that Paul was a dedicated Christian, wouldn't you, by reading about him and all the things that happened how he was stoned, how he's been persecuted, how he uh, left his first religious uh, thing that he was doing. And he was very religious before he got saved. Uh, and let me tell you something about being religious. Uh, religious people will kill you. They're tough. 
you got to be careful by saying, you know, I, you know, religious people. Religious pe people who are religious will kill you. Because they'll, it, it's a different thing. See, we as Christians, uh, we don't have such a thing as a religion. We have a person in the name of Jesus Christ that we follow. And that's what we do. We follow his teachings. Basically, everything you read in the Bible is what Jesus said. If you read that, that uh, the Holy Spirit moved upon men and, and uh, wrote down the things that God wanted, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was taking orders from the Jesus, whatever I told him to write, to say, to say. So that you see that basically you could say that Jesus, this is all, the Bible is all about this, Jesus saying. You can find that in the book of John. You look at that. And so, and, and, and Paul knew something that, that modern Christians today don't believe or don't know. That there's a judgment time coming for Christians. Did you know that? That we all are going to be judged one of these days. Just like the loss is going to be. Now the book of Psalms says that the that they're not being our congregation and we're not being their congregation in that day. There's going to be two types of judgment. This is the Christian judgment. This is for a judgment about Christians. It's not about your salvation. We'll find that out. I'll show you scripture that proves that. That it's not about your salvation. It's what we have done and how we have acted and how we've lived as a Christian that we're going to be judged or given rewards with or taken away from us. Now, God doesn't do this. God doesn't say all the things you've done as a Christian good things and then the bad things. He says, well, I'm going to take all the good things with you. You know, that's not what it is. It's just that you don't get, if you're not, if we're not getting good things and doing good things, it's going to survive the fire uh, that we have, that we're just going to lose them. Lose those other things. Not the good things that we've done, but the bad things that we've done. And I don't know about you, but I need to watch myself because I, I'm really not a good person when it comes down to it. I'm still learning and still falling. I, uh, I'm, trying to, you know, I'm trying to stay focused and I'm trying to let Jesus Christ live through me more and more and more. I find out every time I say I'm going to do something, I don't do it. Or if I say, I'm going to, uh, you know, not do something, I find out I'm doing it. So, and that Paul had the same problem on that. Uh, but once he surrendered or a commitment, and I think surrender is a better word than commitment, but what, we, what motivates us? The whole thing is what motivates you as a Christian? What motivates you as a person? What motivates you as the way that you live? What, what is that that motivates you? Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. Because look what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Paul knew this. He said, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now when he says we, he's talking about to the church. That's what he's writing to. He's writing to the church. He said, we... We as Christians are going to have to, and he puts himself in there, <clears throat> that he's going to have to stand in the judgment seat of Christ. It's called the Bema judgment of Christ, is what that's called. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now he's talking about Christians here. There's a judgment time as Christmas, as for Christians. I don't know when it's going to come. I don't know when it's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be before we get to get to walk into heaven or after we got up or then it gets us all together. I don't know. But it's, it's going to happen. It, you better know that, that I'm going to stand before God on how I dealt with you. How I deal with you as your pastor. How I've treated you. How, what, what you expected me. I'm going to stand in judgment of that day, of one of these days, of what I've done with you how I treated you. And you better know that you're going to be the same way it's going to happen. He says every man's work this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 13 and 15. It says every man's work shall be made manifest. It's going to happen. It's going to be brought out the light. Everything that we've done, everything that we've said and done in secret or in, in things is going to be brought out to light for God. That's why God knows it. 
We don't do anything. I had a person say that, uh, you know, God couldn't see sin. And I went, what? He sees everything. He just doesn't have fellowship with it or, or joins in with it. But he sees it all. He says, for the day shall declare him because it shall be revealed by fire. Now what that means is, is this. That everything that I do, everything that you do is going to be tried and it's going to see if it's going to do. And you have to imagine now a fire with gold or a metal, precious metal, under it, boiling it, fix it. All the dirt, the things that's not good comes up to the top. They'd scoop that off, scoop that out, scoop that out. And throw it away. All right. And that's kind of what that's talking about. I, I, what we build upon, what motivates me and what motivates you should be our love for Jesus Christ. That should be the motivation that, that motivates us on that. Should help us to get through and do what we're doing. Nothing else. I shouldn't be motivated to come here because, well, you know, it's Sunday and I have to go to church. I like to go to church. Now, I love coming to church. I'll tell you something. If you wasn't here, I still love you. But you, because you're here, I, I get to love you a little bit more, okay? But it, it wouldn't make any difference to me if anybody came or if, if one came, two came, three came. I'm still going to enjoy it because you know what? I came for Jesus. I didn't come for you. I came, I came to serve the Lord and, and have fellowship with Him and let Him help me to be stronger. Because you know what? I need it. I'm not a very good person. I need help in my life. I, I, need, I need strength to Him. So that's what I'm looking for. And that's what Paul would say in, in, in this uh, whole thing about this chapter in Philippians 1 20. He didn't say what I'm going to do for you, Lord. He said what Christ is doing. That I'm not be for what for Christ's sake. See, he put, he put Jesus above his self on He says, For the day shall declare him, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. I, sometimes I feel like I'm in that sometimes now. I can, things happen. We talked about that today in our Sunday morning Bible study about what happened, you know, how we stand into our faith. And, you know, people cut us off while we're driving. You know, kind of, it, it, besides scaring me, it aggravates me. You know, where did they get their driver's license? You know, how did they pass that test? You know, so sometimes you got to go, you know, I, I was like, well, uh, Susie is, is my go-to person to go, don't say nothing. That's what she says. She can catch me before I say it. Don't say it. Don't do it. Now, y'all and me may not have a way like that, but I, I gotta, you know, that's why we don't, that's why we don't ride together. <laughs> <laughs> and she tells me what to do too much. Now, I'm the worst passenger that's ever been. I am not a good passenger riding with somebody. <laughs> Jerry would tell you that. I heard you. I am not. I, I, I'm serious. I, I'm. I don't because I don't feel like I'm in control. I don't feel like you know. Are they seeing what I'm seeing? You know, or what? I, I, I'm. I'm just not a good pastor. I, listen, if I ride with you, and you don't have a good floorboard. I'm gonna knock a hole in you, put the brake on. Now I don't let y'all do that. And I'm just telling you, I'm not, I'm not a good passenger because of that, and we have to kind of do that. But our, what we're doing and how we live our life is going to be on trial in these days. We're going to give an answer to Jesus Christ for how that we have lived as Christians. You better mark it down. It's, it's true. Paul believed that. Paul said, we're all going to do that. We're all going to give that. And then he gives us uh, examples in the, to, to the Corinthian church how they were all doing all kinds of crazy things. He's reminding them, hey, listen, look what's happened to you. 
But modern Christians today don't believe that. I run into all kinds of this in now where we just, when I die, I'm just going to go to heaven, that's going to be in there. No, you're going somewhere in that, after that, you're going to have to stand before Christ and give an account of every day, every hour, every minute. I don't know about you, but that joy makes me weak. That makes me feel, uh, I mean, I think about that, the Lord of mercy, I'm, I, you know, if it wasn't for grace, I would be in bad trouble. Now, it's not for my salvation that I'm being judged for. How do I know that? How do I know that my, that fiery test that's going to be there is not for my salvation? Not judging me if I'm going to get to go to heaven or not. The Bible says it. Listen to what the Bible says. If any man's work abide that which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And here's what that's a picture of. It's a picture that you've worked all your life about on your house and everything that you've owned, you've worked hard for. It. That has motivated you to do that. And that's a great thing, isn't it? To have that. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with having nice houses. There's nothing wrong with having nice things and everything else and working for it. That's fine. But that's not the whole picture. And we've got to look at that. But that's what's motivated you. You wanted a fine house. You wanted a fine vehicle. You wanted to have money in the bank. You want that motivated you to have that on it. And then all of a sudden, in a moment, in just a moment, you lose it in a fire. And all you get out of all the things that you worked your whole life for is gone. Now, I've had to deal with a lot of people that's went through that. That's lost everything. Just to, my brother's house burned down in just a matter of minutes. They just barely got out with everything that he'd been working for. I remember when he bought that house. I was young. He bought it in Knoxville. Matter of fact, we in the big housing project that he lives in there now, it's huge houses everywhere. But when he got there, there wasn't any houses. We coon hunted in that where they have houses now. We run coon dogs through. We come out of this house and get the coon dog, take off running through. Now it's, it's a house, 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 house. I mean, it's huge. It's a huge housing project. And I remember when he bought that house and how the, you know, wanted to put all the things in. And then, and then if his neighbors had to come and go, they'd probably burn up in it. Had to go get them. Had to be house on fire. And by the time they could check it, the lights is out, the house is filled with smoke. He had to, you know, go to the hospital about it, you know, everything. Just in a matter of moments, minutes, you can lose everything. Everything that you work for on this earth that you think that you own, that you have, we can lose that in a moment. A wind can come by, a flood can come by. But here's what he said, that's what's going to happen. So now what do I do? How do I, as a Christian, what motivates me now? And how do I live my life? Let's look at what Romans chapter 6, 13 says. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God. One of the things that I'm going to have to do as a, as a Christian, I'm going to have to surrender to God. I'm going to have to say, God, you're large and you're in charge. And you own me. Everything about me, you own. And, and you're the one. Has nothing to do about me now. It's all about what you want to, me to do. So one of the things I need to do is I need to not live my life, not yield my members over me. That means I can't do what I want to do. Unless my want to has been changed to what do what God wants me to do. Catch that? I mean, we kind of say, yeah, I'll do what I want to. Well, but as those that are alive from the dead, that's how I'm supposed to live. And man, I, before you got saved, before I got saved, I was counted as dead. And then I come, 
I was brought back to, I was brought back to life, the real life, living what God had me do. The life that was really promised him to have and eat. You think how it is to so walking with God, talking with God, being in the presence of God, having God be in our presence. That's what happened to me. When I got saved, let me tell you something, that's what happened to you when you got saved. You was brought where you could come into the presence of God. Now, just think about how powerful that is. That, that now, as a Christian, you can walk into the presence of God because of what Jesus has done. You can walk right into the throne room and not only call Him God, but say, Father. I don't know about you, but that just sounds great. That you can call Him. And the Hebrew, that's Abba, I mean, Daddy. Now, you know, it's a real close thing on it. Yeah. Now think about it, uh, Daddy. The daddies that are in here. What if your children come to you and say, "Father, there's something I would like to talk to you about." I don't know about you, but if my children come and see, come begin to call me Father, I know something's up, buddy. I know something that you know. My bill code is going to be hit. If they call me father. But I just love it when they come to say, when, when my daughter, when she literally, she'd say, Daddy. That's how she called me. Hey, Daddy. And I don't know about you, uh, what y'all did when y'all should have born, but I stood over mine and said, Say Mommy, say Mommy, say Mommy, say Mommy. I didn't want to say Daddy. <laughs> Somebody said, Why? And I said, What, well, 2 o'clock in the morning, do you want them to say Daddy? No, I'm a mama. Oh. But you think about it, now that we can walk into it because we were dead out of this present, now we're alive. And your members as instruments of righteousness of God. That's what we're supposed to be doing. In doing everything about me. When I got saved, everything about me got saved. Everything about you got saved. Even your billfold got saved. Your, your house became God and everything. That's good to have possessions, and the Bible talks about for us to have possessions and go to our possessions and use them and everything else, and, and there's liberty in that. But you have to understand that everything came from God. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 20. What? <laughs> Don't you just love that when the Bible uses that? What? See, we thought we thought about, uh, did that when people say that, we say, what? No, the Bible came about that a long time ago. What? Know you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? And you think about that a little bit, what that means. And I'm not my own. That means that I can't just do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. And, and please God. Oh, I can do it. And that's my problem. I end up going and doing things that I want to do, and those things do not please God. They are not righteous. They are, they are unrighteous. And then he says, look at this. Why? Why am I not on? Sister, you are bought with a price. I've been bought with a price. You've been bought with a price. I've been a price. Now you think about something. How valuable do you think you are? The Bible says if you was to gain the whole world and lose your soul, you've got nothing. So you're more valuable than the whole world. That's how, that's how much value God's put on you. You're more valuable than anything else in the world. And because you know why? If you own everything in the world, you couldn't buy yourself. It wouldn't be enough. And you think how powerful that is. That God done everything for us. That He bought us with, with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your own body and in your, in your spirit, which are God. That's what we're supposed to do. Back in the verse that we want to look at, where we come from, where we started from, it's like we've been on a, pl a plane trip. We've taken off from uh, Philippians uh, 120. We're going to land back in there just for a minute. 
That word according to my earnest expectation. That word expectation, this is the only place it's used in the Bible. It means to really pay attention, really looking at it, to concentrate on to really look at that. That's the only place it's used. It's the only place it's used in the Bible, that word. And it means to, it means to have your head stretched out looking for something. That you're really looking for something on it. And that's what we ought to be doing. And, it, and, it's, and it's the hope that we have. Now this word hope, it's not a hope so hope. Because let me ask you a question. Do you think that Jesus died on the cross or do you hope that he did? He did, right? We don't, we're not questioning that. That's what it's talking about. It's that, that kind of, the Bible, when it speaks of hope, it's not like, I hope, I hope that's right. See, your point of view of things and how that you look at the Scriptures and how that you look at Jesus and what you think of Jesus and what you think of God will, will determine how you live your life. Your world view or earthly view or heavenly view will, de will declare it. Of who you, and how and what you believe in. He says, what well, that he says that, that is nothing that I do that I shall be ashamed of. Paul says, because you know why? He knew that he was going to stand before judgment one day. And he didn't want to be ashamed of, of dragging Jesus' name in the mud. He didn't want to do that. But with all boldness, that means that freedom that he had, as always. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. See, he could have said, here's what I'm going to do to magnify Jesus Christ. No, that's not what he did. He didn't use the term like that. He knew that whatever he did could not do it. Whatever he would do on his own or on his own strength would not magnify Jesus. So what he says in that is he was Jesus. So now also Christ shall be Manifest in my body that Christ is in charge. Christ is the head. What motivates me is, uh, is what Jesus Christ has done and what He loved me so much that He died upon the cross for me. And through that, my body can glorify Him only because of what Jesus is doing. He's not putting the eye in there that here's what I'm going to do. I don't know about you, but every time sometimes it seems like I do that, I can't do it. I had a thing about one of these days. I said, I'm going to read the Bible through in a month. Do y'all think I did that? No. I didn't get through Genesis. Because I'd fall asleep while reading. But I'm going to read it through and I said, I'm going to, you know, I thought, Make you feel better, make you make me more holy, and all this good stuff, make you more Christian. I'm going to read the Bible through. I couldn't do it. But I'm going to tell you something. Everything that I've surrendered to God and committed to God to you, this is, it's not that I can do it. I'm just going to commit to you that you're going to help me, and I surrender to whatever you want me to do. All that's been accomplished. And it's been so easy. Once you surrender to let Jesus Christ be the head of your life and the king of your life, then understand that you've been bought by what He has done. It'll change your life. And, and living in the world will be a whole lot easier. Paul was through, through how do I know it? Because look what he said. If I live or die, Christ will be glorified. He's going to be magnified. He's going to be, it's going to be Him. It's not going to be about Him. If I live or die, it makes no difference. Because why? He didn't trust in everything into Christ. So what is our, what is the thing that we should be doing? Our great commitment? That's in, in Jesus Christ. That's the question. Where are, you, where are you surrendered? How much have you surrendered to Jesus? How much are you committed to Jesus? Um, 
Paul said, if I live or die, then it makes no difference. Because I don't want to be ashamed of dragging Jesus through the mud. And I have to watch myself with that. Because sometimes I've had people do things to me that I wanted to lash back out and not be very Christian about. I've had, you know, and and the whole time I'm getting ready, I can hear it. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. The Holy Spirit will teach you if we're just following. And we'll magnify Jesus Christ. We'll lift up Jesus Christ. With every head bowed, that right shut for just a moment. Let me ask you something. Maybe you're here today and You've never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You're not sure. And right now, God's tugging on you. That he wants you to be saved. He wants you to come trust Him. That He died on the cross for your sins. was put in a grave and came out. Won't you respond to that today? Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian and you just... And I need to hear this as much as anybody in this building. That you know there's some things in your life that, that needs to be changed. And you've tried it several times. I've been there. I know I've tried things and, and did get to But until I surrender over to let the power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit I cannot accomplish, I cannot overcome it. As soon as I do that, as soon as I surrender to the Lord, it becomes easy. Because I'm not living in my power, not working in my strength. I'm allowing Jesus to do it. I'm falling in love more and more with Jesus. And more of following after what he would have. Basically, God is waiting on us to say, Lord, here I am, use me. Would you be willing to do that today, right now, where you are? Say, Lord, here I am. I surrender to you. Use me. My Father, again, we thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. And we just pray in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Amen.